Making a Murderer is a Netflix documentary series that has gotten a lot of attention over the years for a whole host of reasons. Not the least of which was that it dealt with a real-life case that is still going on right now in the form of Stephen Avery, who was tried and convicted two different times of two different crimes, was eventually proven innocent of one of them, and many are fighting to prove he's innocent in another. The first part of the Netflix documentary revealed things about the first Avery case that honestly was chilling. So, with that being said, allow us to show you things you need to remember from Making a Murderer, Part 1. Be sure to like the video and subscribe to the channel. Avery's Wrongful Conviction One of the most important things we learn in Part 1 is that Stephen Avery previously served 18 years for a wrongful conviction. In 1985, Avery was accused of assaulting and attempting to force himself on a woman named Penny Beardson. It wasn't until 2003 that new DNA technology proved Stephen Avery's innocence and he was freed. But that was a long time, and as the show revealed, there were a lot of signs beforehand that Avery was innocent of that crime, and yet he was locked away for 18 years. Basically, all of Stephen's enemies had some tie to local law enforcement in Manitowoc County, Wisconsin. Avery had a strained relationship with his cousin, Sandra Morris, who he threatened with an allegedly unloaded gun after he heard she'd been spreading rumors about him. Sandra was married to a sheriff, so basically Stephen's case was treated more intensely than it probably would have been otherwise. A three-month investigation was launched into Manitowoc County law enforcement after Avery was exonerated. There ended up being no charges for wrongful convictions against the state, so to make up for his 18 years spent in prison, Avery sought up to $36 million in compensation, which, given his treatment in the courts and by the officers involved with the case, would have been a fair trade-off. But then everything changed. The next conviction. Then, on October 31st, 2005, a young woman named Teresa Halbach went missing after visiting the Avery property. Halbach worked for Auto Trader magazine and was there to photograph a van that Avery's sister was selling. Police found human remains in the fire pit behind Avery's garage, and Halbach's car keys were found under a shoe in Avery's bedroom. Stephen Avery was taken into custody immediately and subjected to interrogation without an attorney present, which, for the record, is a violation of his rights. Avery then settled with Manitowoc County for $400,000 and used the money to pay for a high-profile defense team. Avery hired notable Wisconsin lawyers Dean Strang and Jerry Buting. Later, Stephen's nephew, 16-year-old Brendan Dassey, confessed to helping Stephen murder Teresa Halbach. Stephen received additional charges of sexual assault, kidnapping, and false imprisonment based on Dassey's confession, which you would think would make things pretty airtight, correct? Uh, not so much. Forced confession? False evidence? Suspicions started to rise that the cops who interrogated Brendan had coerced Dassey, who has a learning disability, into giving a confession. The investigators who questioned Dassey were Mark Weigert and Tom Fassbender. And this remains one of the biggest sticking points in the entire investigation. The defense presented evidence that only Stephen Avery's DNA was found on Teresa's car keys, suggesting that someone had scrubbed the keys clean of Teresa's DNA and then planted Avery's. Moreover, if Dassey's confession of violently mutilating Halbach was true, where was all the blood? They claimed Dassey's confession was inconsistent with the evidence. Brendan Dassey was denied the option of getting a new attorney, despite the fact that his lawyer, attorney Len Kaczynski, tried to talk him into pleading guilty. Brendan Dassey changed his alibi after telling his mom, Barb, that officers Weigert and Fassbender got to his head. The defense team obtained a court order to examine the contents of Avery's 1985 case file, and they found his blood sample had been tampered with. The seal of Avery's file had been clearly broken, and the test tube full of his blood sample appeared to have a needle-sized hole through the top of it. So all of this is pointing to something that many would say is a conspiracy. Because these things don't just happen, they're meant to happen by tampering. And things just kept getting weirder as part one continued. The Hallbach Issue 
After that, the topic of Teresa Halbach's voicemails came up. After Halbach went missing, her voicemail box became full and couldn't hold any new messages. But later, there was room in her voicemail, indicating that some messages had to have been deleted and by someone who knew her password. Both Halbach's brother and ex-boyfriend admitted to hacking into her voicemail, but denied erasing any messages. During the search for Halbach conducted by her family, roommate, and ex-boyfriend, a family member found Halbach's car in the giant Avery salvage yard. After about only 10 minutes, the roommate apparently gave the woman who found Halbach's car his only camera before she set out to find the Toyota 99 RAV4. Despite this strange coincidence, neither Halbach's roommate or ex-boyfriend were ever asked for an alibi. Convenient, wouldn't you say? While calling in the license plate numbers for a missing person's car, aka Halbach's car, a police officer somehow knew the make of her vehicle. When the dispatcher identified it as Halbach's car, the officer responded, 99 Toyota, right? This was two days before the car was uncovered in the Avery salvage yard. Curiously, the officer was Sergeant Andrew Colborn, who was deposed during Avery's first case, in which he was wrongly imprisoned. How's that for a connection? More connections, more issues. Another suspicious key player who kept reappearing was Lieutenant James Lenk. Lieutenant Lenk was the one who found the car keys and later a flattened bullet on the floor in Avery's garage. Like Colborn, he was also deposed on Avery's previous case. However, there was a contamination issue with the bullet when it was tested for Teresa Halbach's DNA. Hmm. While the bullet had come in contact with Halbach's DNA, a DNA analyst said she had accidentally contaminated it with her own during the testing process. She then claimed there was only enough DNA for one test, so it could not be redone. Weirdly, the defense also found that in the analyst's notes from a phone call with prosecution investigators, she was clearly instructed to put Halbach in the garage or house. A lot of speculation surrounded whether or not Teresa Halbach's bones were transported to the Avery property. The bones expert said she couldn't conclude whether the bone fragments were damaged in transport to the testing facility or, as the defense suggested, onto the Avery property. It would make sense in a certain way for the real criminals to dump the body on Avery's property. His case was well known, and it would be logical that someone who had done a crime before would be up for doing it again. Except he didn't do that first crime, but someone still felt he was a clear scapegoat that would be easy for the cops to go after. Timeline Issues Investigation Issues Scott Taddick, Dassey's stepfather, claimed that Halbach was gone at 3 p.m. on October 31st, the day of her murder. However, the bus driver said she dropped Dassey off at the Avery property around 3.30 p.m., and Halbach was still there taking pictures. Should the stability of her daily schedule overrule Taddock's claim then? Lieutenant Lenk then took the stand. He said that he didn't think it was wrong of him to search Avery's home, unsupervised, despite having been deposed on Avery's previous case. Again, Lenk was the one who found both the car keys and the flattened bullet. The defense brought up the need to test the bloodstains found in Halbach's car for EDTA, a substance used to preserve blood for case file samples. They reasoned that if Avery's blood found in Halbach's car tested positive for EDTA, then it would have been the blood taken from the case file sample. So basically, it would confirm Avery's blood was planted by authorities. The FBI found no EDTA in the blood. Guilty. Eventually, after a few days of deliberation, both Avery and later on Dassey were found guilty and sentenced to life in prison which many people cried foul over, including Making a Murderer, who not only went and made a part two about events, but the case is still going on right now, with Avery fighting as hard as he can to get free. Whether he will or not, honestly, is unknown. So, what do you think? What do you think of this look at the situation that Making a Murderer revealed during its first part? Are you amazed that such things happen and that after 18 years in prison, Stephen Avery was set free? Which of these elements do you think will help Avery get free if things finally start going his way? Let us know in the comments down below. Be sure to subscribe and we'll see you next time on the channel.